good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webcast. At this time, all lines have been placed on a listen-only mode, and the floor will be open for your questions and comments following the presentation. If you'd like to ask a question during the webcast, you may do so by clicking on the Ask a Question button located under the presentation. Simply type your question into that box and hit Submit. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Judy Rutenberg. The floor is all yours. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Judy Rutenberg from the Association of Research Libraries, um, and I welcome you to this um, webinar this afternoon. I'm joined by Nancy Marin and Sarah Pickle, um, two of the uh, lead authors in on Searching for Sustainability Strategies from Eight Digitized Special Collections, um, a case study report and project um, generously funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We do have an all-star lineup today um, on our webcast um, with many of the authors of our um, of the report representing the case studies um, investigated. Um, we will be taking questions as um, suggested at the um, so please do type those in and we will field them at the end for our presenters. Um, a recording of this webcast will be posted on ARL's YouTube channel following the event. Um, and if you are following us on Twitter, you can use the hashtag sustain, D-I-G-C-O-L-L-S. So before I turn this over to, um, to Nancy Marin from Ithaca SNR, um, just Again, a, a welcome and a thank you to our speakers on behalf of ARL and its program for transforming research libraries. Thank you. Over to you, Nancy. Thank you, Judy, and welcome, everyone, to this webinar. Uh, my name is Nancy Marin. I'm the Program Director for Sustainability and Scholarly Communication at Ithaca SNR. And I am Sarah Pickle. I'm an analyst at Ithaca SNR and a co-author on the paper. And our third team partner in this project is Deanna Markham, who is the Managing Director of Ithaca SNR, who just cannot join us today. Before we get into the presentation, we also wanted to make sure that we thank IMLS for their generous funding and the support, and our advisory committee, who has been so wonderful. Um, you will hear shortly about all of our terrific participants in the actual case studies. But before we start, I'll give a small overview to get us going. You know, special collections, and many of you know this even, even better than we do, um, have long held a certain promise for libraries as these rare and unique materials that can really distinguish an institution from another. And some museums, archives, historical societies, obviously a great deal of, of what they hold is indeed rare and unique. In recent years, the opportunity to digitize these holdings, whether it's a collection of photographs, audio, videotape, paper archives, um, has helped not just to preserve and protect fragile originals, but really to turn what were once local collections into global collections accessible to anyone with an internet connection. Mm. And yet there's still a question that hangs out there, isn't there? You know, is the act of digitizing really enough? Um, have the collections been neatly integrated into the institution's daily work? Uh, or are they quietly sitting somewhere, gently off to the side? Um, are people using them, and how are they using them? Has the collection gone from uh, being a local collection to really taking a life of its own, continuing to grow and attract users, developing in new and exciting ways over time? And for all of this, how are the project leaders of these projects faring in their quest to secure support and financing for this important work over the long term. When this project first started, which I believe was back in 2010, Ithaca SNR had recently published some of our early work on sustainability in the form of a series of case studies focused on funding models. In partnership with ARL, we decided to apply some of the findings from that early work to get a real sense of what makes a digital project tick, what makes it truly sustainable, and to take that and look at the case of special collections. IMLS supported this idea and actually encouraged us to expand the study beyond academic libraries to include cultural institutions as well. So we set about identifying eight case studies. We probably screened close to 200 of them, 
with our research team, with our advisory committee, and finally we selected four from academic institutions and four from other types of cultural institutions that met a specific set of criteria for sustainability that we had been able to develop in our earlier work. The first criteria was public benefit and impact. So though it's difficult to compare impact across projects, we needed to hear that the project team was thinking about this and could demonstrate some kind of continued impact, whether that was a qualitative or quantitative measure. That could be the size of the audience, the usage, the type of engagement, other measurements like that. Financial stability. We wanted to hear project leaders tell us about how they had found the means to attract the resources they needed to support the ongoing vitality of the project. Many had grants, but we found ourselves also gravitating to those that didn't just have grants, that also had done other creative things, whether it's working with partners or trying some kind of creative revenue generation. And finally, possibly the most obvious one, longevity. The projects we selected had each have been in existence for two years. So in order to see how a range of institutions manage the long-term care of their digitized collections, we carefully selected these eight, and then looking at things like operating budget as a proxy for size, we made sure that half of them were from larger institutions and half were from smaller. So we're hoping that you in the audience will have lots of different kinds of examples and different scale of examples to choose from. Our method involved interviewing key players at each institution to understand not just what they're doing now to keep their collection vital to their users, but also how they arrived at the models that they're using today. So um, I should mention probably that each of these resulted in an actual article. There are eight case studies that are up on our website now. However, although we would love it if you would read them all, the really exciting part is getting to hear from the actual people who work on these projects. So today we are so pleased to have with us from around the country, all phoning in from wherever they are, the leaders and key staff from each of the eight digitized special collections that we study. With so many fascinating collections, time is awfully short on this call today. We are so aware of this. But we're going to have them highlight some of the strongest themes that we saw emerging in our research. The project leaders are going to speak to a specific point and maybe branch out a little from there. They're going to share with us what it is they're working on, how they decided to take that route, and they may even highlight some of the issues that they still see ahead. So uh, we're going to ask that as questions arise for you, you, not, you type them in as you think of them, and we're going to gather them. At the end of these presentations, we'll then start fielding a bunch of questions. Um, but we're going to see if we'll have each of the eight do their presentations first. So without further ado, Sarah is going to start us off. With many projects housed at institutions, there's an enticing opportunity to get some form of ongoing support from the home institution. This doesn't come automatically, however. So several of these projects provide good illustrations of ways to be sure you're aligning with the core mission and the goals of your host institution. First, we'll hear from Joy Paulson, the director of the Essential Electronic Agriculture Library at Albert R. Mann Library at Cornell University. She's also project director for Cornell's Hearts Collection. Joy? Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be with you. Um, Mann Library is the second largest of 16 libraries that are part of the Cornell University Library System. And we serve the Colleges of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the College of Human Ecology, which in earlier days was known as the College of Home Economics. We chose as part of supporting our relationship with the College of Home Economics to undertake a project in which we would gather together the core historical literature of home economics and digitize it and make it available online. This um, was definitely helped us. This worked well for us because we definitely had a strong relationship with the college. We had, we had missions as part of our university because Cornell University Library had been involved in digitizing from the early 1990s, and we felt that this was a, a good opportunity to build a collection that would be of interest and use to one of the colleges that supports our library. 
We also had a very early school of home economics at Cornell, and we felt we had a very strong collection in which to choose the materials from. We applied for funding and received funding initially through um, IMLS, which allowed us to do the major portion of this project. But since that time, we have been able to because we have been able to continue funding at a low level and assigning staff members to have small amounts of their work that are connected to this project to continue to add um, further materials to the project and to keep the website um, functioning and up to date. So oh, while initially probably 30 percent of my time was involved in the project and I had a full-time preservation assistant and I had quite a bit of, of time from a programmer and we had input from other parts of the library staff, over time perhaps 10 percent percent of my time, um, uh, half time of a, of a preservation assistant, and, and maybe 20 per 30 percent of a, of, of a programmer's time enabled us to keep doing this work. And we were able to use funds that the college made available to the library for undertaking projects. And so this really became much more programmatic. The only major funds that we've had to keep the project going um, was the IMLS grant. Additionally, we were quite surprised to find out, even though we felt we had a strong home economics collection, when we looked, when we developed the bibliographies for each of the sub, um, subjects in, in the area, that there were many highly ranked titles that we were not able, that we did not have in our collection. And through actually our contacts with, um, in agriculture, there's a there's an organization called USAIN, the United States Agriculture Information Network, which is largely agricultural librarians. Many of them, there's some overlap between the two subject areas, and many of them also have interest in home economics. And so we were able to work with a number of libraries that also had strong collections, like Penn State University, the University of Minnesota, and and the University of California, Berkeley, who lent us um, public domain materials that we are able to digitize and add to the collection. And I think that by focusing on the mission and making sure that the collection was something that was not only supported within the library, but was supported by the college that helps help fund the library, that we have been able to keep um, the, the, the site not only active, but growing over time. That's terrific, Joy. Thank you so much. Were there any questions from any of our speakers on this topic? Okay, well, that, that's been wonderful to hear. We're, we're going to next talk about uh, a slightly different theme, but even one that Joy pointed towards, which is a focus on audience. Um, while there are um, lots of different ways that projects focus on audience, we, we chose three right now, but we probably could have chosen many more. Today we're going to hear from Katrina Harkness, the Education Officer at the State Archives of Florida, to tell us about the extensive investments that her team has made in user outreach and understanding. We'll next hear from Robin Chandler, Associate University Librarian at UC Santa Cruz to tell us about the role that her team has played in uh, identifying the fans, not just of the archive, but the fans of the Grateful Dead who oh, might don't care don't about the archive. Yeah. And finally, the Director of Digital Projects at the Maine Historical Society, Kathy Amoroso, will share a bit about how Maine Memory Network staff have worked not only with thinking about the end users, but one of their key stakeholder groups, the actual local and regional historical societies who will form the 27 or the 270 partners that have helped to build up the collection that they have today. So speaking first will be Katrina from Florida Folklife. Hello everyone, this is Katrina Harkness from the State Library and Archives of Florida with the Florida Memory Program. So I'll be talking about finding our audience for the Florida Folklife Collection and um, it's a little intimidating to be talking about audience uh, when I'm speaking next to the Grateful Dead archives. But the Florida Folklife Collection is part of Florida Memory, which provides online access to almost 500,000 items from the collections of the State Library and Archives of Florida. 
new material is added weekly. Um, if you'll see, um, when we first started looking at the Florida Folklife Collection, we weren't planning to digitize the recordings. We were just going to catalog the audio recordings, and we quickly realized that we were going to want to make those available online. And that actually shaped our website. The audio, there's now an audio section, which is one of the main six components of our, our website. Um, an audience uh, is very important to us because we rely on grant funding and public support uh, to continue our existence. The Florida Memory Program is administered by the Florida Department of State's Division of Library and Information Services and is funded primarily through LSTA funds. The Florida Folklife Collection Digitization Project was funded through an IMLS grant leadership, uh, uh, leadership grant. In 2003, we knew the Florida Folklife Collection was popular, but we didn't know if it would reach an audience online that extended beyond the core of researchers who already came to the archives. The collection was created and collected by the Florida Folklife Program. Peggy Bulger was Florida's first state folklorist, and she went on to become the folklorist at the Library of Congress. The program gathered earlier material, including writings by Zora Neale Hurston, and from the Florida Writers Project in the 1930s and recordings from the Florida Folk Festival dating back to 1954. The Florida folklorist embarked on a series of fieldwork expeditions and set out to survey the state. They recorded um, music traditions, occupations. Uh, one of the interviews included a railroad worker, Tom Watson, who talked about his 30 years on the Jacksonville Railroad um, with the famed Orange Blossom Express, and he talked about issues of segregation and integration. Um, we also have an interview with the, a Rainbow Springs boat captain who does the traditional uh, chant that's over 100 years old, and if you listen to that, you can feel you're in a glass-bottom boat with the fish sliding under you. It's, it's really glorious. Um, the program continues to collect recordings from the Florida Folk Festival, which is the nation's longest-running continuous folk festival, featuring Florida folk artists such as Gamble Rogers, Will McLean, and Ida Goodman, Goodson, and national artists such as Vassar Clement, Stock Watson, and Pete Seeger. As part of our grant, we created five educational units on net fishing, white oak basket making, seminal doll making, sacred harp sing singing, and the Zora Neale Hurston uh, WPA papers. They received uh, attention from teachers, some of who tell us they teach the units every year, and also, which was surprising to us, many from people outside of education with an interest in the subject matter. The um, seminal doll making particularly uh, had an emotional connection for people who remembered maybe coming to Florida and seeing the seminal dolls. And the, um, the, the detail that went into making them, including um, going out and gathering the palm fiber that was necessary to make the dolls. Um, they have a beautiful uh, collection of both the series of slides and the interview. So we knew we had some great material, but we didn't know how to let other people know what we had. Outside of a core group, most people didn't really think, hey, great music, when they thought about the state archives. So one of the first things we did after the collection was digitized and online and cataloged was to put out a sample CD just a small selections of songs and spoken uh, word to let people know what we had. It was free, strictly educational, since it was grant-funded. It was immediately successful, and we heard from people all around the country and the world. Um, we found out then that uh, Florida Folk um, has a following in England. It was popular in Australia. Uh, we were really kind of surprised by, by the number of people we heard from that called us and emailed us and told us they were interested in this music. Um, we'd only planned for one CD, but based on the reaction, we put out another sample CD and then three more featuring gospel, bluegrass, and blues. Building on the continued request for the CDs over the years, and we get requests daily, the next thing we plan to start is a Florida Folklife Collection Internet Radio Program. The reaction of the Folklife material was both far, more far-reaching than, ex than we expected and also intensely personal. We would have people call to say things like, uh, we had the only known recording of their grandfather and could they get a copy. Um, as part of our online outreach, we became part of the Flickr Commons, a Library of Congress initiative to bring together photographs from cultural institutions around the world. Commenters identified people in the photographs, 
or shared stories related to the photos, remembering things like having a Seminole doll from when they traveled to Florida years ago. We also begin sharing the photos and recordings on Facebook and Twitter. We always say, and it's true, that the records of the State Archives don't belong to us. We're just keeping them for the people of Florida. And the Florida Folklife Collection has made that visible. This is truly a collaborative effort with the people of Florida. Thank you. That was terrific. Thank you so much, Katrina, for sharing that with us. Our next speaker is Robin Chandler, speaking about the Grateful Dead Archive Online. Uh, Katrina, I, I just want to say thank you very much. It's an honor to be speaking with you, uh, Well, It's a very exciting music project as well. Um, and thank you uh, for inviting me to participate in the webinar today. Uh, the Grateful Dead Archive represents one of the most significant popular culture collections of the 20th century and documents the band's activity and influence in contemporary music from 1965 to 1995. The collection contains works by some of the most famous rock photographers and artists of the era, including Herb Green, Stanley Mouse, Wes Wilson, and Susanna Millman. In April 2008, the Grateful Dead Band announced at a press conference at the Fillmore in San Francisco that the group was donating its archives to the University of California at Santa Cruz. The band, really recognizing its history, sought to make the archives available for research in a traditional fashion, as well as through the internet, where the band's 30-year history could be interpreted through the digital display of archives and artifacts. And based on this unique relationship between the band and its fans, and the fan tape sharing of live performances, the library really felt that it was a natural progression to try to seek to build a socially constructed collection. So we knew we had a very special opportunity to engage a living community of deadheads, and that it was an ideal time to leverage social media, providing the fans with tools to tag, comment, comment upload, and share their digital files memories and knowledge, and we concluded that the Omeka open source software would provide the best platform to support that collection. So in 2009, we received an IMLS grant to digitize over 45,000 items and build the website we now know affectionately as GDAO or the Grateful Dead Archive Online. We released the website at the end of June 2012, and at that time we also released the Grateful Dead Archive collection for research by scholars, as well as opened a uh, permanent Grateful Dead exhibit space in the library uh, that we called Dead Central. It's important to note that we always recognized that we had multiple audiences for uh, GDAO. Uh, first off, there would be the serious scholars of the Grateful Dead uh, that could use the GDAO resource as well as our finding aid uh, available in the Online Archive of California. Um, there were the rights holders to the materials we had scanned who in a sense were an audience. And then also the Grateful Dead deadheads who could help us build the collection online. In 2008, there was over 600 linear feet were transferred to the UCS library, and uh, this was processed, and the finding aid was created. And it's just important to note the kinds of materials that were there, uh, business correspondence, financial records, photographs, posters, fans, fan envelopes, fanzines, tickets, t-shirts, uh, videos of documentaries and performances, radio interviews, and also three-dimensional objects. Um, it was very important for us to build a audience with the rights holders themselves as well. Um, over the course of processing the collection, we compiled a list of over 400 photographers and artists whose work is represented in the collection, and we sought to go out and uh, seek uh, permissions from them to be able to put the material up online. This was a very diligent process. By the end of June 2012, when GDAO was released, we had received uh, 50 signed licenses. There's a lot to say about that. Um, it's a very interesting effort that we wonder went, uh, but I'm going to move on to talk a little bit more about building with the socially constructed collection. Um, the, the current slide you're looking at now is essentially uh, a slide that illustrates our search results in GDAO for some of the socially constructed materials. Um, since the end of June 2012, G the GDAO web services team has been tracking usage and demographics on the website. 
in the first year, GDAO has, I'm sorry, in our uh, almost two years now, we've had over uh, 163,000 unique visitors and a total of 231,000 visits. Um, while the majority of the visitors have come from the United States, um, we've had visitors globally, uh, including Canada, the United Kingdom, Germany, Japan, Spain, France, Australia, Sweden, and Italy. During that time, users have submitted over 140 digital images and files documenting their Great Bell Dead experience through their artwork, through their personal photographs, through their tickets, and their stories, and particularly their memories. Um, and their memories about how they became a deadhead, revealing their favorite show or song. Uh, 300 items have been tagged, and we've received over 1,000 comments. Uh, community members are actively participating as curators, assisting with metadata additions and corrections. Uh, looking ahead, the Grateful Dead project team has plans to continue digitizing materials from the GDA and making those materials accessible online uh, through GDAO. Um, in terms of our uh, looking, looking to the future, our ongoing challenges, um, our issues predominantly focus on around uh, funding to sustain a programmer to continue to build and enhance the website, as well as staffing to pursue and continue cultivating the community to build this socially constructed collection and community. Um, towards that end, we pursued and received a, another IMLS grant to build uh, additional functionality into a Mecca, uh, and that functionality would be made available to the larger community of Mecca users and indirectly would benefit GDAO. And in terms of staffing sort of working to build our social media capacity, um, we have a Grateful Dead archivist who's a permanent full-time employee, but we are definitely working to spread that uh, social media capacity throughout the library staff that can assist with reaching out to the community and working with them. So thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, next up is Kathy Amoroso to tell us about the Maine Memory Network at the Maine Historical Society. Thank you. Um, so I'm Kathy Amoroso, Director of Digital Projects at the Maine Historical Society. And um, I want to say that we're honored to be included in this study because sometimes we're stuck up here in Maine and, you know, we kind of think that we're a little, little shop just doing our own thing. So it's nice to be recognized. <laughs> Um, so Main Memory Network be began actually 12 years ago um, and when we first launched with about 2,000 items from the Main Historical Society. It was something that we got state funding for um, with the idea that from the beginning we wanted to be the online repository for all Main primary source documents if we could. Um, and so now we have over 270 uh, organizations that contribute items to main memory with um, which amounts to about 45,000 items at the moment and that's growing all the time. Um, the, the ratio is about 70 percent of the items are from contributors and about 30 percent from Maine Historical Society. So in addition to serving um, and, and training contributors we are also trying to put up our, our own things. So um, Maine Historical Society is a private member-supported organization, so we do not really get state funding. So it's all been grant-funded at this point. Uh, so uh, let's see, the, um, back in 2001 when we launched, I was hired as the outreach coordinator on a grant that was called the Technologies Opportunity Program through the U.S. Department of Commerce, and the idea for that grant was to spread technology around the state. So we hired two other part-time outreach coordinators uh, that were based, one in northern Maine and one in down east, which would be far eastern Maine. And we, it was really important to us to have someone who knew that community and was part of those communities. So the, they didn't see it as someone from Portland coming into their place and taking their things. So when we first started, there was a lot of fear and um, people thinking that Maine Historical Society was going to take their objects or that we were going to absorb the copyright of their things. And so we, there was a lot of um, education we had to do on copyright 
and and not that we're lawyers, but we had to learn a lot, and um, to try to ease their fears and say it's okay to put some of these things online. And uh, so we worked for two years and continued to work on giving demonstrations and training and uh, teaching contributing partners who may be just an organization that's one member, two members, up all the way to the Maine State Archives that actually has some paid staff, how to digitize and put their things up on Maine Memory Network. Um, So we offer uh, a lot of trainings. The way it kind of works is that either someone will contact us, an organization will contact us and say, hey, we heard about Main Memory Network, we'd like to put something, we'd like to put our collections on, or we might identify collections around the state and, and go kind of recruit them and say, this is a great collection, how do you feel about putting it online? So we offer individual training, uh, which usually takes about two hours, uh, to show someone how to scan and catalog uh, each item, or we have also done group trainings, and this is a picture of um, some group trainings. I'm not as mean as I look there. Uh, so, and um, there's a lot of hand-holding, and because a lot of these organizations have volunteers or older staff or older people that are sometimes scared of technology, so we help them sometimes not even uh, not just learn how to scan, but how to use their computer. And um, the other thing that's really important is to have a user-friendly website and to make it easy for them. And um, I'll, I'll show a, a cataloging slide in a minute, but this, this shows how we really value our contributors and we make it very prominent where each item is contributed from. So here you can see contributed by, and there's the name of the organization that then links to contact information about them. So a user or visitor to the site could knows exactly where that item is. Uh, we also watermark the items to help alleviate fears from the contributors that people are just going to come here and, and steal their items. They're low resolution, it's not high resolution images anyway. Um, this is a cataloging page, just the top of it, and it's very simple with a username and password based on Dublin Core. We train people how to fill out I the information about each item. And quality is really important to us as opposed to quantity. So we may have contributors who only put up 12 items, but we work with them to really have them flesh out the information in the record and tell us why that's important to include in the archives and why a user would want to do that. Um, so over the years, we've uh, continued the outreach, continued the training. We have gotten a variety of different grants uh, for different reasons. Um, and the, here's a picture of some group training that we've done for a grant where uh, it was to create community projects. It was called the Maine Community Heritage Project. And uh, we trained different groups that included a school, historical society, and a library to build online exhibits and actually a mini website. And uh, we actually have a staff that of about three uh, that works primarily full-time on main memory network and our web uh, properties. And that's how we've been able to focus so much on doing this. It's our priority when someone calls to become part of main memory network. We go out, we train them. Uh, we do find that the individual training actually works a little better than the group training just because each person has a different setup and different levels of understanding of technology. So one-on-one, -on -one, there's a lot of hand-holding. And um, also, I, and I'm just getting into some challenges here, is that the uh, main memory network or digitizing their collections is not always the first priority of an organization. So often they will tell us that, oh, I don't have the time, um, and we Try to, or they're overwhelmed. I don't know where to start. So we will work with them to try to identify key collections and say, okay, why don't you just start here? Um, and then we have some things we have coming up to continue our um, communication with them is we have conferences, contributing partner conferences, and we have one planned in the spring. And then um, 
We also just received a grant to include items from individuals, which is really scary, but uh, we will we have to define our uh, what we're going to do and how we're going to do this, but that's the next step for uh, main memory network. Thank you so much, Kathy, and also Robin and Katrina. We appreciate it. So we all know that the costs associated with things like this kind of audience research and the outreach that we just heard about uh, for these collections, as well as all the other activities involved in caring for them over the long term are, are far from insignificant. So whether we're paying to license software or to migrate files as technology changes, the, the costs rarely ever go away. Staff from several of the collections we studied found clever ways to manage their costs by distributing production and management work across multiple partners and even agreeing to share a platform with like-minded institutions. On that latter point, we'll hear from John Andres, former head of special collections at Haverford College Library and project leader for Quakers and Slavery. And he'll speak about how his collection benefits from the tri-college partnership of Haverford College, Swarthmore College, and Bryn Mawr. John? Um, thank you. It's uh, great to be here. Um, I should say that uh, Haverford is a small liberal arts college uh, outside of Philadelphia, and uh, the two other colleges that we're in consortium with, uh, Bryn Mawr College and Swarthmore College, um, are also in the area outside of Philadelphia. Um, so in addition to the three colleges um, having this uh, uh, library consortium, um, Haverford and Swarthmore both have uh, very strong uh, internationally recognized uh, collections of Quaker uh, history and um, material. And um, so at the end of, uh, or, or in 2008, um, that was the anniversary of the end of the slave trade uh, in North America. And um, my colleague, uh, Chris Densmore at um, Swarthmore, and I thought that we would like to do something to sort of commemorate that. Um, at the same time, we got involved in planning um, a conference, an international conference that was held in Philadelphia on the topic of Quakers and slavery in 2010. And um, so those two things were sort of the impetus for us uh, um, putting together uh, a grant proposal for um, uh, digitizing materials on the topic of Quakers and slavery. Um, one of the things that we thought would be really strong about this was that this would um, allow us to bring together materials that had really never been together before. Um, uh, for those who know anything about uh, the history of Quakers, there was um, the Great uh, Schism uh, from 1827 until uh, 1950. And um, uh, so uh, not only were um, different Quakers divided, but the materials of, of Quakers got divided between our two repositories. Um, so it was a great opportunity for us to be able to bring these back together. Um, the project uh, consists of um, both a website that includes things like a timeline, um, essays on people, organizations, and themes, and um, shows some relationships between different people, um, as well as the collection of digitized materials, um, which li lives on uh, an instance of content DM. Um, so uh, we were grant funded uh, by uh, the state of Pennsylvania's uh, LSTA grant, a digitizing grant, and um, uh, to the tune of about uh, $33,000. We used all of that money to pay for student and intern um, hourly pay. Uh, you know, we were already set up digitizing. We had the equipment. Um, we contributed staff time. Um, so it was great to be able to put all of that money uh, directly into um, uh, cheap labor of um, students and um, interns, so we were able to get so so much out of them. Um, the students uh, did a range of work from data entry uh, and scanning to uh, metadata creation, um, including doing first passes on subject analysis, which then librarians would follow up follow up on. 
Um, the interns uh, did a lot of the coding for the website. Um, and all involved had an opportunity to um, write essays for the website uh, in addition to um, uh, noted scholars that we sought out to, um, to contribute to some of those essays. Um, the project really depended very heavily on um, the staff, uh, the, the project staff, um, writing very thorough procedural documents and spending a great deal of time training the students and the interns and reviewing their work. Um, so the, the time put into that was really paid off um, marvelously. Um, as I said, uh, it's sort of in two parts, the website and then the, um, the uh, uh, repository of materials on Triptych. Um, Triptych is a content VM uh, uh, instance, and um, we share one instance among all three schools of so Bryn Mawr, Haverford, and Swarthmore College. Um, it includes about 54 collections. Um, most of those are collections that are uh, individually at one school, um, but some are combined. Um, this uh, sharing, uh, consortial sharing, uh, goes very deep um, for the three schools. Um, not only do we share cryptic, but also a joint library catalog, um, a joint institutional repository, um, another database of, um, of art and artifacts, um, and uh, the three schools also share um, collection development responsibilities. Um, so the way that um, this platform, Triptych, as well as others, are uh, managed, um, the oversight is, is spread out at various levels and to different people uh, and groups at the three schools. Um, Individuals at any of the three institutions can, um, you know, elect to create a collection and do the digitizing and metadata and uh, sort of be in charge of that themselves. Or, you know, in our case with Quakers and Slavery, it was two schools with um, sort of multiple people involved. Um, and then each platform that we work on has one super user. Um, who sort of deals with is the first uh, line of defense for dealing with problems um, either submitted by uh, users or by other librarians and um, helps to set metadata standards and uh, you know keep keep people uh, to some degree um, uh, on the same page about all of that and then there's um, systems administration um, for uh, for content DM for cryptic, um, and the systems work is all done at Bryn Mawr College, um, but is supported financially by by all three schools. And then there is an advisory committee, the technology advisory group, that's made up of librarians and uh, technologists from all three schools. And so this sort of tiered uh, approach where. You've got uh, individuals making decisions about their collections and a super user maybe trying to solve uh, problems, systems people uh, maintaining the systems, and an advisory group that sort of oversees um, larger scale um, uh, issues. So John, um, that's perfect, but I think we're going to need to move on to um, the next. Was there a final word you'd like to have? Um, sure. I'll just say that... Um, uh, as challenges, um, we, the site continues to grow, um, but we um, certainly have um, limited staffing at uh, the, the institutions and other competing demands. You know, there's other things that we uh, also want to be doing, and so that um, you know is, makes it difficult to um, continue in in such a robust way. But it, it does continue incrementally. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I apologize for that prompt, but we want to make sure everyone has a chance to come in, and we still want everyone with us. We're going to do questions and answers following, so I'm sure there will be people who have questions for you as well. Um, you know, we love hearing these examples also of cross-management and ways to creatively work with students, work with partners, and work with other institutions to bring costs down. But we're also aware that that doesn't always get everyone 
as far as they need to get. And there are times when you may find that you need to seek some kind of revenue generation. In this section, we're going to hear from Jody Combs, the Associate Dean of Vanderbilt University Library, who will tell us about the Vanderbilt Television News Archive and its sponsorship programs. Following him will be the president of the American Antiquarian Society, Ellen Dunlap, who's going to talk to us about her institution's, institution's licensing model. Jody? Hey, thank you, and thanks to Ithaca SNR for generating this report. Uh, we're pleased to have been a part of it. I do want to mention the slide you're seeing uh, on your screen is from the as a screenshot from our new website for the archive, which we hope to launch in the coming months. Uh, most of you will probably have heard of the Vanderbilt Television News Archive and know something of its history, so I won't go uh, over that since it is a long one, other than to say that the archive contains recordings and abstracts of over 45 years of broadcast news from the major U.S. networks, along with a range of special broadcasts, such as those of presidential speeches and congressional hearings. This past year, the archive received an Emmy and the Governor's Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Mid-South Chapter of the National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences. It's an absolutely unique resource, and we consider it to be among our most important special collections. The theme I've been asked to chat about a bit today has to do with decisions over the years to develop funding streams to cover some of the costs of running the uh, TV News Archive. Of course, maintaining and operating an archive involves significant ongoing costs. The Vanderbilt Library and University have been very generous supporting the archive over the years and continue to do so. But we try very hard to offset the direct costs of the ongoing operation through a variety of external funding streams. Uh, these do not by any means cover all the costs of maintaining the archive, but cover most of the direct costs for ongoing operations. I'd like to mention three or four primary funding streams. One is uh, fees that we receive associated with the loaning of our materials. Uh, these fees relate to the activities associated with the work of compiling segments, creating DVDs, and shipping, tracking, and receiving those items. From the very beginning, following its three-month pilot phase, uh, which is now, by the way, going on 46 years, uh, there was a thought that the archive would have fees for certain services, initially for compilations of materials to be loaned on tape. These days, the process of creating a compilation is partially automated and less labor intensive, and of course, we use DVDs instead of tape in most cases. But these fees continue to be a source of funding, although uh, it is somewhat unpredictable from year to year. It's difficult to be certain, but I would venture to say uh, that revenue from this source is generally trending downward possibly due to the increase in uh, alternate sources for some of the materials or for materials that might substitute for them uh, for research and teaching purposes. A second funding stream established more recently comes from institutional sponsorships. These are primarily institutions of higher education or research organizations which rely on the work of the archive and contribute to support its ongoing operations. Sponsors of the archive receive a few benefits. At this time, they have access to our abstracts, uh, which contain over one million records of program segments. Uh, they are also allowed streaming access to a portion of our collection, of course, under tightly controlled conditions. And I would like to mention the significant but indirect benefit of helping ensure the archive is able to operate. We continue to examine other potential benefits we might be able to offer sponsors. Uh, this particular funding stream amounts for a growing percentage of direct operations and is a bit more predictable than that uh, of the loan fees. It con continues to grow, but it's not growing as fast as we would hope. A third stream comes from an annual contribution from the Library of Congress. Um, this is a fixed amount of funding, and although it does not account for the largest percentage of, uh, percentage of funding for direct operations, it is uh, the most predictable source. Uh, we continue to provide preservation quality copies of our recordings and our records to Library of Congress for permanent preservation, and so they also contribute by being the preservation partner for the archive, which to my mind is an even more significant contribution 
and, and the funds they're able to provide. The fourth stream of funding, which has also been present since the very beginning of the archive, is philanthropy. From time to time, we receive gifts from foundations and individuals who value the work of the archive and want to contribute to its continuing operations and to ensure its future. This is also an unpredictable funding source to date, and while greatly appreciated, is the smallest of the four streams. We continue to pursue opportunities to increase this stream, so if anyone listening today has deep pockets and a passion for history of broadcast news and our shared cultural history, please give me a call. I'd love to talk with you. It's not the case, as is sometimes assumed, that grant funding provides significant support for ongoing operations. The archive has been successful in attracting grant funding over its history, but those funds have typically been related to short-term projects to address changes in technologies, or in a few cases for urgent rescue missions to uh, rescue items from the deteriorating recordings, uh, not really for ongoing operations. While all of these funding sources combined largely off offset the direct cost of ongoing operations, I believe it's not wise to assume that they will do so indefinitely. During its 35 years of operation, the archive has seen drastic changes not only in technologies, but in the economic environment which impacts its operation. A simple illustration should serve to make the point. How many recording companies that you know of currently rely on business models based exclusively on selling vinyl LPs and 45 RPMs, for those of you who know what those uh, mean? As technologies change, they often drive changes in the economic environment and business models. Uh, the converse is also true. Sometimes economic changes will drive changes in technologies. In either case, the archive will be impacted by these types of changes as much as any other operation would be. For this reason, even as we continue to rely on the funding sources I've mentioned, we are actively exploring additional and different options. I'm not sure yet what new sources or models for support may emerge, but I believe it will continue to be con critical to seek out additional options. We hope to convene conferences in the coming years to focus on this issue, along with very important questions raised by the changes in the way people receive and consume the news in an age of social media. I'm excited by the prospects for the archive. In a time when the tools for voice, speech, and pattern recognition are maturing, and techniques for large-scale data mining are becoming more commonplace, the opportunities for innovative uses for the materials in the archives are enormous. I believe I'll leave it at that, so we'll have more time for questions from our participants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jody. Um, next, we'll hear from Ellen Dunlap of the American Antiquarian Society. Hi, everyone. I'm going to keep my remarks very brief. Um, the report that Deanna Markham wrote on our digitization strategy for Ithaca is very complete, and I do recommend it to everyone on the call. Um, ours it was, is a very different kind of approach, and we recognize that there are some, some controversy surrounding the approach that we have taken. And I think that Deanna has done an excellent job of addressing the controversy, but also trying to point out how a program such as ours, which is very big scale, could have lessons for smaller institutions as well. Uh, the American Antiquarian Society is a National Research Library of American History. Ours is a comprehensive collection documenting our nation's history through the year 1876. Uh, we were founded in Worcester, Mass. in 1812, and we continue to flourish here with a robust program of research fellowships, seminars, online exhibitions, and educational offerings for academics, undergraduates, and the general public. We are an acquiring institution. Uh, if it's printed in America before 1876 and we don't have it, we want it. We sometimes can't afford it, and that's why uh, we have turned to the, uh, revenue generation, such as our digitization, to help us build our collection and support our mission. I think it's important to point out and for you all to understand that we are entirely independent. We are not part of a university or a government body. We are independent in terms of our governance, but also independent in terms of our funding. We have to balance our own budget. 
But one way of looking at us is that we are a private institution, but for the public good. We developed our digitization strategy in about 2006 as a formal initiative, but we have been in partnership with commercial publishers and information companies since 1955. Uh, we started in the micro opaque card uh, opaque card uh, business and moved through microfilm and microfiche into the digital era. But as we uh, looked at the broadening our commercial partnerships, we deliberately sought out a variety of digital publishers, each with different business models and markets. Some of the companies that you see with logos here on the screen uh, are database companies, some are print-on-demand publishers, some do e-books, some are in cookbooks, genealogy, uh, most are in the academic research space, but we deliberately wanted to have a diverse portfolio of business plans and partners. Um, we also did something a little bit different. We wanted to capitalize on the strength of the collection, not only in terms of our uh, collection holdings, but also our metadata and the bibliographical knowledge of our catalogers and curators. So we developed partnerships that were interested in having us as co-partners in, in the shaping of the products using our expertise. And we hired a business development consultant to manage these publisher relations and to negotiate all of our contracts. Uh, briefly, our strategy is twofold. It is a financial uh, return that we are looking for, and we are also looking for them to do the scanning for us and turn the ownership of the scans over to us so that open access at the end of the commercial publishing effort can be possible, and that is our intention with all of the scans that we have received. Um, we, thus far, we have gotten more than $10 million in cash royalties, and we don't have them all yet, but so far we have about 25 million scans that have been created on our behalf, and these will come to us, as I say, at the end of the licensing period. But this is not our only digital strategy. We also have in-house digitization that's done, and we do that some through grant-funded projects, but patron orders and staff requests, online exhibitions. And we have about 80,000 scans currently in our digital asset management system, which we call GG. And those are freely available on our website and are making the rich collections that we hold here available to scholars and the general public alike, especially in the areas of manuscripts and graphic arts materials that are outside of the partnerships we have with publishers, which tend to be more text-based. Um, I would say that in closing, uh, the, the terms of our contracts are um, uh, specified on page five of the uh, report, the Ithaca report, and I think that I would recommend you look for the details of how we set up the contracts. Uh, you, you should look there. Thanks so much, Ellen and Jody. Last but not least, we have a section on staffing and leadership. So. Perhaps it's because of the financial constraints that few digital collections, and even those discussed today fall under this category, have staff devoted full time to their leadership. The challenges can be compounded when the project's organizational model is a partnership of institutions, even. The case studies have shown us that well-managed partnerships can be very powerful, but they can also pose challenges. Our final speaker, Carolyn Sheffield, who is program manager for the Biodiversity Heritage Library, is going to tell us a little bit about the role of partnership and support of the BHL. Thank you. Um, as others have said, it's an honor and a pleasure to be included in this report and uh, to have an opportunity to share information on the webinar. So thank you. My name is Carolyn Sheffield, and I am the Program Manager for the Biodiversity Heritage Library. With only a few minutes, I'm going to be very brief on the background information, so I really do encourage everyone to check out our website and to read the Searching for Sustainability report if you haven't already, to get some more context on how we got started and the extent of what BHL does. 
as well as to learn more about each of the other institutions that we've just heard from. So uh, without further ado, what is BHL? In a nutshell, we're a consortium of natural history and botanical libraries with the mission of working together to make biodiversity literature openly available to the world as part of a global biodiversity community. The reason that we're doing this is that the legacy taxonomic literature, which remains an important part of contemporary research in systematic biology, is often found only in the libraries of renowned natural history museums and botanical gardens throughout the world. And before BHL, these materials were usually only accessible to those who could afford to travel to those locations. So BHL was formed to provide wider access to these materials, and we now provide open access to over 42 million pages of biodiversity literature. BHL started in 2006 with 10 natural history libraries and has grown to 16 participating libraries in the U.S. and U.K. As a consortium, collaboration across these libraries is an inherent part of BHL and has been very important for achieving and maintaining success. BHL started out as a grant-funded project and has transitioned into a program that today is supported through a combination of membership dues, in-kind support from member institutions, contributions from the user community, and direct support from the Smithsonian libraries, as well as subventions from other institutions and grants for specific projects. These funding sources support the various pieces of the data organizational structure. So I'm just going to give a quick walkthrough of that structure, and then I'll give an example of how we work together across our institutional boundaries. So to get started, the executive committee is comprised of three individuals three member, from three of the member institutions at the directory level. They provide governance and decision-making at the policy level for BHL as a whole. The secretariat is comprised of the program director, the program manager, myself, and the collections coordinator. And so that's representing two and a half full-time employees dedicated to BHL. And the three of us are based at the Smithsonian Libraries. We're devoted solely to the day-to-day -day operational management of BHL, and so we're engaged to the goals and product strategy level. We're responsible for things like proposing budgets, and ensuring that BHL achieves the annual goals approved by the BHL Executive Committee. Members are dues-paying institutions. 13 of those 16 uh, participating libraries are dues-paying members, and each of those institutions has a representative on the members' committee, usually also at the director level. Affiliates are institutions who may not be able to pay those annual dues, but who do make significant contributions in terms of in-kind staff time. And I should mention that in addition to dues, members also make very significant contributions, um, in-kind contributions. In 2012, we were looking at about $2 million worth of in-kind across BHL, and that represented about 14.2 full-time employees. We also have a tech team that supports and maintains the BHL portal and continued development. And last but not least, BHL staff. These are the people on the ground at each of the participating institutions doing work such as scanning, responding to user requests, and feedback, and supporting the outreach efforts of the organization. So how do all of these components work across all of these different institutions, across 16 different institutions? Um, as one example, we have something called the PAN-BHL Scanning Fund. Each year, the members committee, those director-level folks at the participating institutions, vote on how much of the annual dues will be applied to PAN-BHL scanning. The uh, secretariat then coordinates adding those funds to a contract with Internet Archive. And those uh, funds become available as a pool that any dues-paying member can uh, draw from for scanning materials at their institution that will be made available through BHL. Obviously, when you have 13 institutions spending money off of one contract, everyone's going to need to do their part to track their own spending so the group as a whole does not overspend. So we maintain collaborative spreadsheets where we track things like spending, 
as the program manager, I monitor that spreadsheet. We also have something called the monographic deduper that DHL staff use to prevent scanning of materials that are either already in DHL or already in process of being scanned by another participating institution. That duplication is monitored by the collections coordinator as part of her role on the secretariat as well. So there are many, many hands in the mix, and I've covered only the very tip of the iceberg. But hopefully this kind of helps to illustrate how much commitment and time and dedication and oversight is needed from not just kind of the secretariat level, but all from all of the participating libraries to make the HL the success that it's become and to ensure its continued growth. Thank Alan, you. Thank you so much, and that's such a great note to end on. And I, we see there are a lot of questions coming in. First of all, thank you to these speakers, but before anyone goes anywhere, we're going to field these questions, but first we're going to ask you to respond to three very, very quick polls on this platform. So, Amy, can you send that first question out to people? We'll give you just 15 seconds. It's just one click of a mouse. And uh, we'll ask you to answer them. Amy, is the first one coming? It should be coming. Okay. All right, Amy, let us know when we should move to the next question. I want to make sure folks have a chance to respond, but it's really just one little click. All right, stopping question one. Closing question two. All right, and Amy, you want to read us the second question just to fill the air here? In addition to yourself, how many people viewed this webinar with you? Terrific. We really, we just want to know. Um, we are fascinated by the fact that there's such deep interest in this. Um, obviously, we care a lot about this, and we know you all do too. And we're just, we just want to know who's out there. And how about the third question? Oh, the second question just showed up. Hang on one second. Question three, which of the case studies did you find most relevant to your situation? And here, we're not asking anyone to play favorites, but we are also just fascinated again to find out, um, you know, which, which examples seem like they're the juiciest or the ones that are going to help you do something different, you're learning about something you haven't learned before. Um, we'll certainly share this with everybody. Um, so if you can just take a moment to click. All right. Amy, does it feel like we got what we need to get on that question? Um, we're showing a little bit low numbers on people answering it. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yep. And if anyone's Pretty having good. trouble, okay, just let us know. So, um, all right, you let me know when you've closed the when you've closed the poll, and we'll start the questions and answers. Poll is closed. All right. So, um, speakers, we've gotten a bunch of questions. Sarah's going to send us a couple. Um, uh, and for the ones we don't get to, everyone, we're going to see how many we can get folks to respond to. We'll post the rest on the website. But Sarah, let's, let's try the first question. Sure. Uh, we have a question that just came up, actually, about how the push to digitize and then put all these special collections uh, materials online and open access has affected the funding stream of special collections. I assume that means more like materials funding streams. Um, since one stream usually came from providing copies of unique materials to users by charging for um, inventory productions, perhaps, um, and other similar things. 
So would any of the speakers like to address that first? I can talk here at, uh, at AAS, we have seen an increase in our requests for digital reproductions uh, in, all across the board. Uh, more access means more demand. This is Kathy exactly. from Main Memory Network. I would say the same thing. Um, and there's also a question in here about um, have we considered um, selling reproductions of things on Main Memory? And yes, we actually have a sister site of Main Memory Network where we bring in about um, $24,000 a year uh, from reproductions and the contributors get half of whatever the cost is that is sold. So it makes Thanks it more accessible. Thanks for mentioning that, Kathy. Has anyone else had experience with um, with selling? I mean, we've heard from from Vanderbilt, but anybody else? All right. Well, um, let's move on to another question then. Uh, we had a question about about collaborations and you know whether. Sometimes people don't contribute the way that they initially had expected to be able to. Um, how do you handle partners that don't produce according to the initial um, uh, agreements between between you guys? Anyone out there have any partnerships that didn't quite go that the way they had hoped that can speak to that? Of course, with um, I can speak to that at Main Memory Network again. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we have people who are, are over-ambitious sometime and then they get into it and find that they, they just can't, can't do it. Um, we do what we can to help them along. Sometime we will actually do some of the digitization for them and go to their place because they just find out they can't do the re have the resources or something or don't have it. Um, and other times, unfortunately, they just kind of drop it and uh, we move on and then maybe contact them later down the road and say, are you ready now, or anything like that. So that's kind of how we do it. Any other thoughts? From We have a couple of the project leaders who have very deep institutional partnerships. Um, we're not asking you to say anything uh, bad about a situation, but can you give any guidance about tips for working, good working partnerships? Um, I think in, as far as AAS is concerned, obviously in a portfolio play you have some publishers that uh, produce uh, better results than others, and I think it's important in your licensing to have an exit strategy or ways, in fact, in some of our publishers, their right to commercially produce and distribute the materials ceases if they don't meet certain benchmarks along the way, and it's all in the license contract. Jody, did you have something to add? Yeah, I think that that would, would go for us as well. That is, you know, part of the agreement that we make with our sponsors, for example, um, you know, includes um, any number of uh, uh, requirements, and if if those aren't fulfilled, then then we move on, as, as the saying goes. We also heard from somebody who wants to understand a bit more about how the different uh, institutions and, and collections um, demonstrate impact, and that's both on a qualitative um, measure and then a quantitative measure. Can anybody speak to how they track their impact and the public um, that they're reaching? This is Carolyn with DHL. Um, we maintain a series of statistics, both for our website and for all of our social media and outreach efforts. And we share these statistics on a quarterly basis. We make them publicly available on our website through uh, quarterly reports. That's terrific. Um, you know, we have, we're right up against the end of the 75 minute time uh, period and it's heartbreaking. We have so much more we would love to discuss with you, but as I mentioned, we will capture these questions. We will ask our presenters to feed back to us and we will uh, share this on our, on our website, on our blog. Um, Judy, if there's nothing else to add from you. That's it. Thank you very much to the um, speakers and to the audience. Thank you so much, everyone. We're so glad you could join us, and we hope we'll get a chance to speak with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.
And ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's webcast. We thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your lines and have a great day.